On the screen is a display of the Analog Discovery 2 oscilloscope, channel 2, and the signal that it's displaying is a uh, sine wave at around 1.8 megahertz. The purpose of all of this is to demonstrate the use of the analog discovery in circuit design. Now, the circuit that is actually being uh, displayed on the screen is a Colpitz oscillator, and you'll notice it's a rather simple circuit. It consists of a transistor, a bias network, a tuned circuit, uh, an output load, and this particular circuit comes out of the laboratory manual to accompany modern electronic communication by Beasley and Miller. This particular experiment is experiment number seven for a Colpitz RF oscillator design. And while the circuit itself may seem relatively simple, it has the elements of much of what someone learns in doing electrical engineering or electronic engineering. For example, from this circuit you can learn how transistors amplify, how to design a bias circuit. You can also learn about filters, about resonance, and about amplification and oscillation criteria. Now generally the criteria for an oscillator is that the total gain around the loop must be slightly greater than one and the total phase shift around the loop has to be uh, zero degrees or in other words in phase so that the, the signal being fed back is in phase with the signal that created it so that it adds to the input and this continues to build up until you get sustained oscillation. Now we'll talk a little more about that in a moment, but the purpose of this circuit being arranged the way it is, and this is not the way a Colpitz oscillator would normally be arranged, but it's been rearranged specifically for purposes of demonstrating how this circuit works. You'll notice over here that the feedback loop can either be shorted to ground or it can be connected to an internal uh, signal or it can be connected over here. If it's connected over here then the voltage across this capacitor becomes the feedback signal because of course this is grounded. It's drawn this way. Normally the feedback circuit in a uh, Colpitz oscillator is in the emitter. I have chosen this particular arrangement because it allows you to illustrate everything about an oscillator as well as amplifier design and more importantly for the purpose of this experiment the use of the analog discovery in testing and refining electronic circuit designs. What we're going to be doing is first we're going to be setting up the bias for this stage. Now you may notice we just use a an RF choke in the collector. So the collector is going to essentially be at VCC. We therefore place a resistor in the emitter so that the total voltage from collector to emitter is about 5 volts, about half of VCC. So, uh, and then we set up a bias network so that the transistor will operate at that point. Now understand the bias network is only to create the DC operating conditions. So let's take a look at that. Here is a simplified diagram of the amplifier portion of the Colpitz oscillator. You'll notice that in addition to the RF choke I mentioned earlier and the emitter resistor, 
there is a capacitor across the emitter resistor so that for AC signals this point is essentially at ground. There then are a pair of resistors that form a voltage divider from VCC. The purpose of that voltage divider is to put about 5 volts on the base. We chose 5 volts because that's half of VCC. With the half a volt across the emitter to base junction, that means that there will be about 5.5 volts from collector to emitter in the static condition. We chose 15K resistors for R1 and R2, in part based on the equations that are given in the book, and we can go over those if you'd like, but in general, the first thing you have to do is establish what your emitter current is going to be. The emitter current is essentially the same as the collector current. Then, in this case, we decided that the emitter current should be around 3 and 3 quarters uh, milliamps. From this and the fact that we use a 1K resistor, that tells us that we have about uh, four and a half volts at this point, simply Ohm's law. With four and a half volts here, an additional half a volt across the base to emitter, that gives us five volts here. This will be at 10 volts because there's little DC drop through that inductor. So with this at 10 volts and this at five and a half or four and a half volts, this will then be at five and a half volts across the transistor. So that's how we established the bias network. And I won't go into any more of this if some people would like a little more information on how you decide these things. Once you have decided the emitter current, you generally want to keep the base current down below a tenth of the emitter current, or roughly. That's why you chose 15K resistors. The uh, base current is approximately 0.375 milliamps, or 375 microamps. That's one-tenth of the emitter current, and based on that you calculate these two values, and I simply chose 15K because those are nice standard values. Okay, now let's talk about the amplifier itself. In addition to the bias network, we have an input capacitor to allow us to put signals into the uh, amplifier without upsetting the bias. Uh, this blocks the DC. We also have a uh, capacitor on the output leading to a 680 ohm load out here. This simulates the load of whatever you are feeding with this oscillator, for example. This might be a mixer or a converter of some kind, or it might be a frequency multiplier or a variety of different things. But we are assuming that it presents a load of about 680 ohms. The unique thing about this circuit, as I mentioned earlier, is that we've placed the tank circuit in the collector. Normally you don't do that, uh, but for reasons of clarity in showing feedback, we're going to do it here. The reason is that now if we disconnect this connection, there's no feedback, and this then works like a regular amplifier, so we can study its characteristics. If you have the tank circuit in the emitter, unfortunately, if you disconnect the tank circuit, you also disconnect the DC current path for the emitter. So we've arranged it this way. However, as you will see in a moment, it works just like any other Colpitz oscillator. That is, at a particular frequency, the resonant frequency of this network, there is a circulating resonant current that goes back and forth due to the feedback and a portion of that, that is the portion from ground to this point or the voltage across C2, is picked off to be fed back. But before we do that, let's actually look at the characteristics of this amplifier without feedback. The amplifier is constructed on a small prototype board, and we're using the Analog Discovery 2 to measure 
We're also going to be use the analog discovery to, to put a signal into this amplifier and look at its uh, frequency characteristics. To do that, we have a jumper that allows us to either uh, connect the feedback or to connect the waveform generator of the analog discovery too. If we use the waveform generator and no feedback, then this is simply a, a simple transistor uh, amplifier. So let's take a look at that. Channel 1 is displaying, that is the, uh, the yellow trace at the top, is displaying the input to the amplifier. I'll show you on the schematic in a second what that's doing. The trace at the bottom, the blue, is channel 2, and that is displaying the output of the amplifier. So let's take a look at the circuit and see what that means. And by the way, you may notice that we have the arbitrary waveform generator set to about 1.8, or I'm sorry, 1.5 megahertz. It's approximately the frequency of oscillation. For these purposes, all we are trying to do is verify the gain of the stage. Now, if over to the left, you see that the range of channel 1 is 20 millivolts per division, and the range of channel 2 is 20 millivolts per division. So, as you can tell from the uh, fact that the bottom, the, the traces are the same millivolts per division, the bottom trace is slightly taller, so we have some gain at one and a half megahertz. Actually, we have quite a bit of gain, but we are, uh, because we're loading this pretty heavily at this point, we're only displaying some of the gain. So the gain at this point is probably about 1.5 to 1. On the circuit, channel 1 is showing this value, that is the input, and we are using the arbitrary waveform generator of the analog discovery 2 to generate a 1.5 megahertz input signal. The uh, oscilloscope 2, channel 2, is connected across this 680 ohm load resistor. Now right now we aren't using the tank circuit, it, but it still is influencing the circuit somewhat. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to use another feature of the analog discovery that's very useful in a case like this. It's called the network analyzer. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to sweep the frequency from here, from about 1 megahertz to about 3 megahertz, while measuring the phase and amplitude response at this point. Now we don't have to make any, any changes to our connections because we have, we're using the wave generator and scope channel 1 at this point, and we're using scope channel 2 at this point, which are the same connections you use for the network analyzer. So let me set that up and take a look at what that shows. Now all we have done is we stopped the scope and the waveform generator and started the network analyzer. Now what the network analyzer does is it applies an input signal from the arbitrary waveform generator and then compares the response on channel 1 to the response on channel 2, in other words the gain. Let's now tap off the tank circuit and look at the gain phase relationship as the, uh, in other words, from the feedback. Let me show you what I mean by that on the schematic and then we'll look on the, the network analyzer. We've been taking the output off this resistor for the network analyzer. In other words, we've been checking the gain from the input to the output on this 680 ohm resistor. We're now going to move channel 2 of the oscilloscope to this point and measure the voltage across C2, which is going to be the actual feedback voltage. Now you see a quite different characteristic. We're now looking at the feedback voltage. In other words, the voltage across the uh, capacitor. Remember in a Colpitz oscillator, the feedback is generated by using a pair of capacitors in a voltage divider. This is the gain. 
you'll notice that the yellow line shows the, the uh, unity gain. In other words, 0 dB. The blue line is the gain at that point. So you see we have a gain which is greater than 1. And down here we show our phase shift. And you may notice that the 0 degree line runs through at about this point, which is almost exactly the point of maximum gain. So at somewhere around 1.8 megahertz, this circuit should oscillate. Let's remove the input and connect the output of the feedback network to the input. I will do that while the oscilloscope is connected. So let me set that up first. Now I have the oscilloscope connected to the output of the oscillator. And what I'm going to do, there's no feedback right now. Now I'm going to make the feedback connection when I say so. Now. And you see that we get a, uh, an oscillation at a frequency of about 1.8 megahertz. And uh, an amplitude, you see the amplitude of the uh, of channel 2 is set to 1 volt per division. The frequency is about 1.78, 1.8 megahertz, roughly. And you see that we're getting about 3 divisions of uh, amplitude. So about 3 volts of oscillator output. So what we're, the whole purpose of this was in large part to show how you can use the analog discovery. By carefully rearranging the circuit we were able to use the network analyzer to uh, display, I'll go down here and remind you of that again, to display the frequency and phase characteristics of the uh, amplifier so that we could determine that there was sufficient gain and the right amount of phase shift, that is zero degrees, to satisfy what's called the Barkhausen criterion for oscillation. And having determined that that was, uh, that that worked, we were then able to connect the feedback loop and the circuit did indeed oscillate at 1.8 megahertz. Now a couple of small points about this circuit and for those of you that are only interested in the analog discovery you probably won't, won't uh, need to pay attention to this but if you are designing Colpitt's oscillators one of the important criteria is the ratio of those two capacitors and the reason is, if you want a linear or a relatively linear sine wave out of a Colpitz oscillator, you want the feedback voltage to be just enough or just a little bit more than enough to sustain oscillation. That means that if you have a, gain, a stage gain of about 20, you want the feedback voltage to be a little more than 1 20th of the output so that, for example, using e round numbers, if you have 1 volt being multiplied to 20 volts and then you divide that by, say, 19 down to, say, 1.1 volts and you apply that to the input, the 1 volt that you used to have is now 1.1 volts and what will happen is the stage will gradually build up oscillations until it can no longer increase and the, tra the transistor either hits the point where it's being cut off during one cycle or part of the cycle or it is saturating during part of the cycle. At any rate, the gain of the stage will adjust itself so that you maintain oscillation if you have a proper relationship between C1 and C2. In this particular case, C1 is 
approximately 10 nanofarads and C2 is approximately 1 nanofarad. And those were chosen to give me a 10 to 1 divider off of the output. That produces a fairly linear wave, as you may recall from the waveform generator. However, if you are getting an output that is not sinusoidal, like this one, what you may need to do is adjust the ratio of C1 and C2. At any rate, the purpose of this whole experiment was in part to show how Colpitz oscillators are designed and, and tested, but more appropriately it was intended to show how you can use an analog discovery, in this case the analog discovery 2, I'm sure it'll do the same thing with the analog discovery original, we built up a small circuit, used the analog discovery first to verify that the circuit amplified and that it produced sufficient gain at the oscillating frequency. We then used the network analyzer to verify that the phase shift and the gain at that frequency were sufficient to produce oscillation. And then we used the analog discovery oscilloscope to verify that the circuit was in fact oscillating. So I hope this has been a useful exercise for those of you, whether you're trying to repeat the experiment in the uh, book by Beasley and Miller, or whether you are simply interested in using an analog discovery in designing electronic circuits. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope to do some more using the analog discovery or the analog discovery too. Uh, but stay tuned and have a nice day.